and welcome to another Tree Lady Talks where this week Sharon is talking to a tree preservation officer. Ah, forest bathing as we all know it, the marvellous new invention, it's a fantastic thing, look, the warbler, the blackbird, the thrush, the baby deer pottering along the forest floor, and of course, oh hello, just when you thought it was going to be a nice Sunday watching the final day of the test match, the chainsaws start, the hackers, the slashers who want to take out everything in their path. Sometimes there's a really good reason. In this case today, there wasn't. Let's find out more. Sharon, take it away. Well, welcome to Stephen Downing. You're the Tree Preservation Officer at the London Borough of Islington. But we're not going to talk about your role today at Islington. We're going to talk about a previous job you had. So, Stephen, Tell us a little bit about yourself, please. I started tree contracting in in uh, early ninety, early to mid nineties, and then got my first tree officer, tree inspector job. While I was doing tree contracting, I did, you know, did the three years at Marysford NDR, and so started doing some uh, tree inspecting in Camden ninety nine for a year. From there, uh, I started as a tree officer in Waltham Forest Council. From there, um, went to Enfield, and that was my first planning role. And I was there until 2019, where I've joined Islington. And so you moved to the London Borough of Islington, which um, is a fantastic team of people, and we've interviewed John Ryan um, for the first series of the podcast. Actually, just to backtrack a bit to your job in Enfield, that's what we're going to be talking about today, because you um, were instrumental with, I think, a record-breaking TPO prosecution. But before I ask you about the case itself, many of our listeners don't live in the UK, and I wondered if you could just tell the listeners what is a tree preservation order, who makes it, what does it mean and what can't you do? Oh, you're putting me on the spot now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tree preservation order. So it's statutory legislation and uh, in, in regulations in the, in the Town and Country Planning Act 1990 to legally protect special trees, in inverted commas, um, trees which the, the local authority, the local planning authority, the council, deems as trees which are expedient to the amenity of of the locality and the borough. So usually they're publicly visible in some way, um, and usually they're good specimens of trees. So yeah, it's to protect to protect those trees from unlawful um, felling, pruning, um, and, and and damage and harm. Um, so anybody who wishes to carry out works to those trees um, has to submit an application formal application which is an actual planning application the same as if you were wanting to build a house um, it's the same process you submit a pl- an application to the council to um, uh, request to carry out those works to those trees to that tree or those trees um, which are protected under that legislation um, and the council deems if 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 the uh, work is um, acceptable or not, and we'll just and then we'll and we'll either say yes, you can to carry out that work, or no, you can't carry out that work. And if people ignore that, Stephen, it's a criminal offence, isn't it? It is a criminal offence if you carry out works to those to a tree that's protected under that legislation. If you don't get permission from the local authority to carry out those works. They would be in contravention of the Town and Country Planning Act 
and it carries a an un, unlimited fine depending on um if there has been a financial benefit gain from you carrying out the works to those trees for example if you felled a tree which was preventing which was uh, a developer felled a tree which um allowed them to then build a house where that tree was sited potentially the fine could be as much as the developer would uh, gain from from selling that property or the value of that property fines are creeping up in the and certainly of of late there's been a couple of um significant cases in the country and actually prosecution's fairly rare so i've also been a tree preservation order officer in the past and I did carry out a couple of prosecutions, but that was in a 11 year career and it was very hard to gather evidence and to get it through the systems within the council to demonstrate it was in a public interest to do so. And it's a long and convoluted process. Would you agree? Oh, oh, absolutely. If it's a case where the local authority is coming across a, a tree that's been removed or been harmed or damaged and it's been some time since and there's no immediate recourse to prosecuting anybody or, or, or being able to carry out a, a reasonable investigation I think it would be difficult yeah it tends to be more cut and dried for um, immediate prosecutions where, where, where as I say you're catching them red-handed. So Stephen how did you first know there was a problem yeah, it, it was at the very beginning of uh, 2019, 4th of January, and one of the planning enforcement officers uh, at Enfield, um, who was still on holiday, um, had been uh, walking his dog in an adjacent park to the site that we're going to discuss. Um, and there was a lot of smoke coming from that site. So they contacted one of their colleagues in planning and enforcement to check out what, what the smoke nuisance was. Planning enforcement officer went out there, managed to get on the site. It's a big uh, property, uh, l you know, a really expensive property. It used to be a stud, a small stud farm, about sort of 50 acres site. Um, half of the site was a lot, very, very large house um, with grounds and gardens and the other sort of half of the site was more sort of farmland type. So anyway, yeah, planning enforcement officer managed to get on site, um, was was confronted by security there and kicked off, but he did manage to see that lots and lots of trees had been felled and there was bonfires going on and, and, and loads of smoke created. So he came back to the office asked and asked me to check to see if you know, tell me that some trees have been felled. Um, we checked the um, TPO records and, yeah, the site was um, completely covered by an area tree preservation order which had been served in 1969. The whole site was also in a conservation area, which is another part of protective legislation under the Town and Country Planning Act. And, and again, it, it partially, it, well, it does protect trees which are located with, within a conservation area as well. Can I um, jump in there because that's really interesting. So it was an area order from 1969 yeah. so that would be any tree that was significantly present in the year of 1969 and so the, the remainder of the trees then would be protected under the conservation area legislation providing it was 75 millimetres in diameter trunk diameter measured at 1.5 metres from the ground. So you had two separate pieces of legislation. And I'm going to ask you later about felling licences. But first of all, you got the call from the enforcement officer who was chucked off site. You checked your paperwork. And then what happened? Yeah, well, uh, just going back to that conservation area thing, what it looked like was that... Um, because then further into the investigation of, of the case, you know, there was a lot of uh, aerial photography that we was able, historical area, aerial photography that we was able to look at. And what it looked like, that um, the site had been partially planted up um, with forestry species, coniferous species, 
um, amongst all of the other broadleaf trees and, and whatever was there previously. Probably planted up under a Forestry Commission grant in the 50s, I'd imagine, uh, 50s, 60s. So, And it looks like the TPO was probably served more or less straight after that planting occurred. Um, so, yeah, so the TPO covered everything that existed in 1969. Um, and then, the, as you say, the conservation area would have protected anything growing since in, in terms of uh, contravention under the Town Country Planning Act, the offences are the same. Fines can be slightly different, but 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 it's more or less a similar similar contravention under the Act, under both parts, the Tree Preservation Order and the Conservation Area part. So then myself, yeah, found out the site was protected. Myself and another planning enforcement officer went out on site. We gained entry via a, via one of the gates, immediately come across a, a barn that had been half filled with freshly cut timber, logs, um, took a load of photos of that, walked, start, walked, walked across the site towards where the action was occurring. Basically a small woodland, a, a reasonably sized woodland actually, <laughs> was in the process of being, for want of a better phrase, smashed to bits. Um, it was There was a couple of excavators there, uh, which was just ripping trees up. There was a few people, there, there was only about three people there, actually, um, sort of swinging chainsaws about and cutting bits down. And, and um, there, there, it, wasn't, it wasn't professional. When we was looking at the site, it looked like they'd just got in an ex excavator and stuck the arm of the excavator out and span the excavator around and just whatever it hit just went for you know and um so anyway go on go on site myself and the planning off officer told everybody to stop what they were doing informed them that the, the site was protected by tree preservation order in the conservation area and that, that it was potentially illegal what they were what the, the works that they were carrying out and it and it was it was quite a shocking sight actually. As I say, it was not a small woodland which had basically been completely decimated. There was trees everywhere. It was as I say, it was in January, so it was a bit quite muddy. That you know there was there was caterpillar tracks from the excavators around there, which were like you know half a meter deep, and um, there was piles and piles of brush around. There was about. There was about a dozen bonfires sort of smouldering away or, or, or flaring away. And there was ash piles, which were like two metres deep. It, it was it was unbelievable. It's one of the worst things I've seen in my career, in actual fact, um, with regards to tree destruction. Planning enforcement guy that I was with, he, he went around and was taking photos of everything. A security guy came out of one of the uh, came out of the building and, and we told him what what we was doing and where we were from and that they needed to stop works and they were committing an act a, a, a contravention an illegal act to the town country planning act and then one of the guys who was working got his boss on the telephone and um, he in turn then got hold of the property owner and I had the same conversation with him now this was on a Friday and it was now sort of Friday, late Friday afternoon. And um, so there was nothing that we was going to do immediately with regards to investigation then. There was one big, really big sort of raging bonfire going on. And we allowed them to sort of spread that out and, you know, so that it would die down and go out. But they had to leave and... and um, couldn't carry out any more works and that, that we would all be planning enforcement and myself and whoever else was going to be involved would be turning up on the Monday to sort of investigate the site. And um, and so that's what we did. And um, fortunately, they didn't carry out any further works over the weekend. And, they, and then on, on that Monday, planning enforcement team went down mop-handed. I think there was about half a dozen of them. And there was myself and... Andy Robinson, who was the art manager for the public trees at Enfield. It was such an astonishing sight, and there was so much destruction there. 
I didn't really know how I was going to sort of start investigating what had happened. Um, so I dragged him along to, to, to give some assistance and so that we could sort of discuss a plan of action, as it were. Planning enforcement carried out some on-the-spot um, interviews under caution with the contracting manager um, who had turned up on the Monday and the property owner who had turned up on the Monday. Did they know you were coming? Friday, we had said that we're going to all come down on the Monday. And and, and I know there, there was some other sort of communication back at the office with the um, contractors who were working there and, and the property owner. And, and so, that, so it was arranged to meet there, everybody to meet there first thing on the Monday morning. On that Monday morning, enforcement carried out um, some on the spot um, interviews with, with the property owner and the contracting manager. Um, and they, they were just like a grounds clearance firm. They weren't, they weren't tree contractors in any way. So, yeah, they carried out those interviews. Myself and Andy walked around the site trying to ascertain what what trees had been removed and damaged and, and, and how to how we were going to go about sort of recording what, what had gone on there, you know, how many trees had been removed, how many trees had been felled, how many trees had been damaged. They, 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 they were, as I say, there was at least, there, I think there was about 14 bonfires which had Good gone grief. on. You know, we, we found out that all of this work had been carried out over that sort of Christmas, New Year period of about, I think it was probably, I think it was about 10 days they come through when they sort of first started working there, just before the Christmas, and then and, and then um, on and off over that sort of period. So and and there were some enormous trees which had come down, you know, some enormous Corsican pines, some you know, there's a big yew, which, you know, which which was I think it had about a ninety centimetre dbh, all all sorts of stuff there, mixed broadleaf and coniferous species there. Um, oak, ash, yew, sycamore, a um, few maples, and then a various coniferous species, which, as I say, had, um, had probably been planted during um, that forestry grant. But also there was a few bigger ones, which, had, which were obviously older as well. There's a, there were some enormous course of combines there. Um, fortunately, they'd left a few of them. Um, <laughs> So you could sort of compare what what we, which ones have been felled and 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 what 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 they looked like before it. And then from there, it took us about a week to investigate the site uh, properly. We contacted the Forestry Commission, and one of their representatives come down because, as you mentioned a little bit earlier, I was uh, wondering about felling licences and and if there was a there was a contravention under that legislation, it was determined there wasn't because it was a residential property, um, and felling licence doesn't apply to a residential property, so there wasn't a contravention under that. We had the police down because obviously there was a habitat, a large habitat. Mm-hmm wildlife habitat that had been destroyed they they recorded it as a crime under that and we and the council commissioned an ecologist to carry out a survey of the site there there was a big pond on site as well and the entire property was adjacent to a another site separate site which did have a record of great crested newts so the ecologist was investigating for that because obviously that would have been another crime under the wildlife and countryside act fortunately or or unfortunately as the case may be as a result of the investigations by the ecologist there was there, there wasn't evidence of any sort of great crested new um habitat on the site and although habitats had been destroyed undoubtedly you know there was a woodland there once and then <laughs> over a week it had disappeared um, there wasn't any sort of physical evidence of um, habitat, you know, of, 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 of confirmed habitats, which um, would have been uh, sort of 
able to have been used as evidence in, in a prosecution under the Wildlife and Countryside Act. We then commissioned a tree firm to carry out a really quick survey of every tree which was still standing on the site so that we could so that we could uh, sort of have a record of what what was there at the time and if that like, they continued to carry out any works over you know over a period of time we'd have a you know we'd have a sort of confirmed record of, of trees and tree species and lo- locations on the site and then uh, myself and um so I grabbed another one of our the tree officers, spent about four days, I think, wandering around the site, looking for looking for counting tree stumps and photographing every tree stump and rooting around wood, you know, massive wood piles and digging out stumps out of enormous fire pits, recording every sort of tree stump that had been fed, you know, recently felled or ripped out the ground. And any tree, any other sort of trees which were which had been which were still standing and damaged. May I just jump in there? I've got several things to to ask you. I mean, I, I had my own smaller situation like that thirty years ago, and I remember it took its toll on me emotionally. And you you've really relayed very clearly, in matter of fact, what happened. But be honest, Stephen. How did you feel on your way for that first site visit? And what did you feel when you saw it for the first time? I was shocked at the level of destruction. As I say, I've, you know, I've, I've been in the industry for 28 years. And undoubtedly, it is the worst incident of tree destruction that I've come across. So I don't know. I, I don't know if I'm too cynical now. But I, I, was, I was angry, but in a very considered way, I think, because I knew that an offence had been committed and we had caught them red-handed and that, you know, as long as we had all of our evidence and investigation and prosecution in order, there was literally no way they're going to be able to get away with it. The property owner and the contracting manager were brought in for a taped interview under caution. And although they admitted guilt, some of the reasons for them carrying out the works were were absolutely laughable. The, the, you know, they all said, oh, we wasn't aware of any tree preservation orders on site. And the contractor hadn't checked himself. Um, he was a friend of the property owner. He, he was at best really, really naive, I think. The property owner, I'm a bit more cynical about. You know, he's a, he was a he is a very very wealthy businessman. You know, he was sort of playing dumb. Not only wasn't he aware of the 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 tree protection on the site, which he definitely was, because we had evidence of when he bought the property several months prior to this this incident occurring. The council had evidence that his legal team had you know, chased up the council's legal team for, you know, what were um, what land charges were on the site and, and, and whatnot. And of, of course, you know, the, the, the fact that it was in, in a conservation area and the fact that there was a tree preservation order on the site were, were presented in, in his buyer's package, as it were. He probably got a bit caught up in, the, in, in what he was trying to say because on one hand, one hand he was saying, was saying that he wanted to remove a lot of the trees because he wanted to improve views from the property. Why do we have to have a forest everywhere? He wanted to remove it all, basically, to uh, create some sort of uh, farm. They pick your own fruit, pony rides for kids, disadvantaged kids. When we were interviewing, it was, it was hard to keep a straight face with some of the things he was saying. Yes, I'm glad this is audio because I haven't kept a straight <laughs> face. <laughs> point of view it's kind of I'm I'm relating it to my experience 30 years ago it's kind of exciting stressful and also you've got your normal work backing up and I don't know of any tree officers in the UK who haven't got enough to do so as tragic as it was 
it was exciting, you know, and I, and I knew this was a, as I say, you know, I've, I've been doing this a long time and I, and I knew this was a significant, a nationally significant case, as it were. You know, I, I hadn't, regardless of whether I've come across it personally or not, I, I hadn't heard of a TPO contravention case as significant of this. So, so Stephen, this sounds like one of the biggest cases I've ever heard of. I mean, how many trees do you reckon were destroyed? Yeah, it was, I think we counted uh, about 284 stumps. The, the stumps we counted were at, at least uh, 15 centimetres in uh, diameter, as the, as the smallest diameter that we counted. Um, but when we were looking at the sites, we, we decided to split everything we um all the stumps that we come across into sort of four sort of categories you know zero to 25 centimeters 25 to 50 50 to 75 and 75 larger than 75 um centimeters obviously this isn't at, at um diameter at breast height this is whatever we found so there was 284 stumps of various sizes um and when i say stumps that that include, you know, we could see they were stumps. So they were either stumps still in situ in the ground or stumps which had been ripped out the ground and they were either just scattered around or in some sort of wood debris pile or remnants of them in in um, a, a bonfire in an ash pile. So that's what we could see. Undoubtedly, there were probably a lot more which had been disappeared and burnt to the ether you know in in the in the week during the week or so previous um as i said earlier you know there was a, a lot of sort of remnants of bonfires there and a couple of them the ash piles were like two meters deep and admittedly a lot of that might have been you know brush and and, and, and brushwood and, and whatnot but but um and, and whatever the understory was was um, made up of there but but I'm sure that there were obviously a lot of smaller diameter trees which which just disappeared and we didn't have evidence of. Um, so yeah, 284 stumps, and that is what the prosecution was determined as. So um, having gathered all that evidence um, on site and in terms of interview, how long did it take to go to court and which court did it go to? It's took a very long time because COVID came along. There was 284 trees and in light that there was no contrary evidence that those 284 trees were reasonable, decent trees of, of reasonable, decent condition. We were able to do a loose caveat valuation of everything we come across. And, and, and the value of the trees that we calculated under that was... 5.6 million pounds wow so because of the valuation it went to crown court rather than magistrates court oh that's really interesting i'm just going to just let some of the listeners know who don't know what cava is it's a financial evaluation of trees based on location size health amenity and which air region it's in and if anybody wants to find out more it's spelled C-A-V-A-T, and they can go on the London Tree Officers Association website, ltoa.org, and go to resources and put in CAVAT, and there's lots of helpful information there. But it is a system that's being widely adopted. It's not law, but it's becoming increasingly common practice. So it went to Crown Court. So you got through COVID. So we're talking what, a couple of years here. The final hearings went through mid last year. So there were quite a lot of delays in, in getting it fully through the, the court system. The other complication was that Enfield Council wanted to um, also prosecute under the Proceeds of Crime Act in part of the property owner's statement he wanted to remove um, some of the, tr the trees to improve views from the actual house on the property. And at the same time, he had submitted, or, or during this period, he had submitted 
a planning application to extend that that house. That would have only directly affected a, a, a sort of hand for the trees and, and not the sort of majority of trees which were removed. But nevertheless, you know, there was potential for a financial benefit to be accrued by the property owner in the removal of these trees. Also because he was saying he wanted to remove them to start up another business and things like this. So that investigation ran alongside the tree part as well. And that involved, you know, property surveyors and, and whatnot. They trying to, you know, value in the property, the before and after and things like that. And there was lots of arguments, as I understand it, between the various parties in how they valued the property and things like this. But nevertheless, an agreement was settled. What was it, January the 4th, 2019? And it was m mid last year to 2022 that everything finally went through. The result of which, on, on, on one hand, I'm pleased about, you know, it, it did end up being a, uh, as far as I'm aware, a record fine and a significant prosecution. But in terms of what we value the trees at, the woodland at, I, I feel like the fine should have been significantly more. Tell us about the fines. How much How much did they get prosecuted and who got prosecuted? So both the contractor and the property owner were prosecuted. In total, all the fines, which included the proceeds of crime um, fine, came out at £255,718. So not an insignificant, in, an insignificant amount. We was hoping for a higher fine for um for the amount that we valued the trees at it, it was a it was an odd decision by the judge because in in his closing comments before um dishing out the fine he agreed that the trees were valued at that 5.6 million and that it was a valid valuation that valuation method is recognised in the London plan as, as a way of that developers can value trees. He completely agreed with the prosecuting authorities' arguments and uh, uh, opinions with regards to the value of the trees and the destruction calls, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then when he came to giving the fine... He determined the fine from the value of the proceeds of crime, which was a hundred thousand pounds, and the and the judge valued the fine as that as a starting point. So in my opinion, I think that's incorrect because, as far as I'm aware, that is supposed to be in addition to the value of the of whatever's been destroyed. So you had to give evidence in court. How long were you in the dock? Well, I, I didn't. I, I didn't actually actually give any physical evidence. Uh, I had there was three witness statements I had to um, write, but because they they had pleaded guilty from the off, there there was there wasn't any sort of argument to be had. Everything was done by witness statements, and I don't know if. That might have been as a result of because everything was delayed, you know, court cases were delayed and stuff like that over COVID. But we went to court. The, the um, defendants were, were present. It was, it was just the, just the, uh, the uh, prosecuting and defendants barristers which were um, presenting any, any evidence and statements that, that, that had been um, provided by myself and various other parties. So what happens next? Is it all over? So a tree replacement notice what has been served for 284 trees to be planted in, in the same area that these trees have been removed. Um, but the uh, defendant, has, the property owner, has appealed that to be determined by the planning inspectorate. I don't know if, if there's been any movement on it. I would find it unbelievable if the appeal isn't dismissed because you know they have yes. failed 284 tpo trees and under the legislation yeah. they have to put them back and there's 
no reason wow. why they can't put them back. You know, that land is still there. It's not been built on or anything like that. And the other thing, though, that is really significant is that the people who have been prosecuted have a criminal record now because it's a criminal offence and all that entails. Yes, it is a criminal act. They have committed a crime and they do have a criminal record now. So, you know, that is going to affect them in, you know, whatever their future lives are going to be. Fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing that. I wonder, did you learn anything or is there anything you feel that you could you could share with other people on how to deal with this type of difficult situation? Not just the legal side of it, but also as a tree officer, just faced with this huge devastation. Are there any tips or tricks to help you navigate your way through? What went really well, in other words, and what perhaps didn't go so well? No, yeah, I, th- I think we investigated it pretty well, really. And I, th- I think I'm quite thorough in those sorts of processes myself in, in uh, work. Very early on, it really helped getting my colleagues to come along and give give their advice and their opinions as to, ha- you know, and have that sort of joint approach to how we were going to do it. So I think it's just a case of being thorough. Don't don't sweat on specific detail. You know, we didn't have to try and identify every species of every tree. We didn't have mm. to know exactly what the, the the diameter of that stump was. You know, an approximation was adequate um, because you know you've got to look at what you're what you're pr- prosecuting, and you're prosecuting a number of trees. Your case isn't. It was an oak. It was an ash. And, and it was exactly this size or anything like that. That may help in certain cases, but, but you know, this was literally the 200. We had, to prov- pr- we had to prove that X amount of protected trees had been destroyed. And so that's what the focus was on. Something else which was really, really useful, we commissioned the services of a uh, drone operator oh. who carried out high-resolution uh, survey of the site. And that was really, really useful because then you had an aerial image and you, and it was such high resolution, you could literally zoom down to tiny little 10 centimetre stumps. That really helped in plotting out a plan of the site and sort of seeing where the groups of trees have been removed and stuff like that. Like that. that was useful. Um, in terms of the actual case, again, you know, writing your witness statements I'm sure anybody who has to do that as a local authority tree officer, your legal team and your planning enforcement team will help you and assist you with that. It's a little bit daunting, I think, writing a Mm. statement because... Yeah, it is. You know, there's a particular way you've got to write. You're trying to filter out any sort of superfluous detail and faff and stick to facts. If this was to happen again, I, I would be a little bit cautious about um, going down the proceeds of Crime Avenue, or certainly insofar that I would want a good discussion with um, your legal team and planning enforcement team as to how, if, if that was going to be pursued, as to how it was going to be pursued and how it might implicate and an impact on the actual level of any fine from the destruction of trees. Because I feel that if that proceeds of crime element wasn't involved with this, I think there would have actually been more of a potential, a potential for a higher fine. The judge agreed that the trees were worth £5.6 million. So if that proceeds of crime element wasn't there, he would have based his level of fine on that valuation of those trades. If people want to find more out about this case, how can they do that? What's publicly available for people to look at? I know there's press releases. Yeah, there's been a few press releases. It's on the various planning resource websites. Well, thank you so much for sharing that with us. And uh, we really appreciate it. And there'll be tree officers up and down the country who might be going through something, perhaps not on such a large scale, but something similar. And it can feel quite isolating. So it's always good to share. Finally, Stephen, I always ask my guests, what is your dream scenario? 
think I think there needs to be a more holistic approach to development, and I, th I think things are gradually going that way. But with you know the the sort of political and social awareness of trees and climate change, climate resilience, and um, mitigation and whatnot. Yeah, certainly where I'm working now, there, there's a, there is a more sort of considered approach with the various people who are involved in development. So it's not just planners, it's or, or myself in trees, you know, it's it's suds engineers, it's landscapers, it's uh, you know, ecologists and people who are working biodiversity, um, the architects, and there's a more considered and holistic approach to creating that better development, which is going to be provide you know, better sort of living and working conditions for, you, you know, residents and users um, in a borough. Um, certainly, you know, with, with regard to creating a better place to live and work in, in, in our time of climate change, which is happening all around us on almost a daily basis. And... Um, yeah, I, th I think there is, there is a recent upsurge in 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 people wanting to achieve those better development. Everybody wants to, I think everybody wants the same thing ultimately, but we all approach it from different directions, and it's about trying to amalgamate all of those opinions and and considerations together to, to sort of form one one goal rather than approach that goal from several directions all approach it from one direction so i'd like to see that um that that is something we're working on and what i'd like to see in the future brilliant well stephen downing thank you so much that was so interesting thank you thank you Well, thanks very much, Stephen. That was so interesting. It's so important to hear from people on the front line. One of the things we discussed was the felling license and the tree preservation order relationship. And for regular listeners who've heard Julian Forbes Laird podcast and another thing, he discusses this in great detail. So if you haven't heard that, go back to the earlier episode. Listeners might be wondering, as I was, about why the Forestry Commission didn't deal with this under a felling licence. Well, the reason why is they considered that this large garden with woodland was part of domestic curtilage. So I just wanted to clear that up. So that's why it was dealt with under the tree preservation order. We have some exciting news. We're going to be hosting a conference, a big debate on trees and the planning process. We want to understand our role and our potential to improve tree care during construction and beyond. We feel that's such an important topic that we have actually booked a fantastic venue for the 20th of February 2024. Get that date in your diary. It's going to be in Essex in a beautiful building called Braxted Park with magnificent grounds. So I want to get tree officers and our consultants together to start talking this through and I'll have some experts and lots of stakeholders and a chance to go out and see the beautiful landscape. So watch this space, the 20th of February, 2024. Well, just thank you so much for listening. We'll have some more things planned. And if you want to get in touch with us, get in touch with me on LinkedIn, Sharon Durdent Hollenby.